In previous chapters, we saw that we human beings are social primates. This means that we innately congregate into groups containing a number of extended families. We live longer together than if we try to go it alone in the wild. We innately cooperate on any tasks deemed to be larger than one person could do alone. These innate behaviors became part of our DNA as they proved to be useful through thousands of generations. And they are innate in the same way that a toddler innately follows mom wherever she goes. We group members naturally settle quarrels before they threaten to tear apart the very society in which our mutual lives depend. Through the last 50,000 years, there have been thousands of cultures around the world. The culture of a group of people consists of their 30,000 recipes for how to do everything in life, including the way that we greet others, make clothes and utensils, cook meals, and conduct ceremonies and such. All of these details fit in each person's brain, but it takes 25 years to learn most of them. About 500 generations, or 10,000 years ago, in Mesopotamia of ancient Iraq, a decrease in climate forced us human beings to begin switching from gathering and hunting to full-time farming. By chance, Full-time farming turned out to be the key to abundance that allowed our population to increase 1,000-fold. One room filled to the top with wheat, rice, or corn feeds thousands of people for months. We then had to invent political structures to organize numbers of persons greater than our innate band of a few extended families. The political system of each culture has unique elements but some generalizations can be made about the progression from bands to tribes and then to chiefdoms and to states. For us human beings, the band is a naturally occurring group. A band is an association of extended families, such as that of the Canela, and contains from 20 to 200 persons or so. The band is held together by strong family ties. Members know each other well enough to predict their behavior in many situations. Band decisions are made through the consensus of family heads. Bands are egalitarian and have no economic institutions, markets, or consumer classes. The plant and rock materials needed to make the tools of daily life are readily available to everyone. For example, each person makes clothes, baskets, and bows and such for themselves, some projects, such as canoe and home building, require the combined efforts of several persons. The band moves around within a home territory that might be either strictly or barely defined. The band often has a strong feeling for its home territory. A band is not cut off from the rest of the world, but interacts with its neighbors. Bands from neighboring regions occasionally meet for ceremonies, to search for spouses, and to trade goods. A trading circle can extend for 1,600 kilometers or 1,000 miles. It takes but one or two dozen such circles to cover the entire world. We human beings are in close touch with each other, enabling the diffusion of inventions described by Ralph Linton. News, techniques, genes, and disease cross a continent in a short time by traveling from one group of people to the next. For example, as 16th century Spanish explorers arrived in Florida, they brought watermelon that did not exist in the New World. Twenty years later, when other Spanish explorers arrived in New Mexico, which is 2,000 miles or 3,000 kilometers away from Florida, watermelon was already there. The particular news of contact with Europeans was also known to have spread by natives at a rate of about 300 miles or 500 kilometers per month. When you went to the next trading place, you too would be anxious to tell others about these strangers. Those of us humans who are Lakota have a special person called a Klamani or newswalker whose job is to travel between villages gathering and passing news of births, deaths, weddings, and feasts and such. Often neighboring bands have an arrangement where spouses are obtained from each other's band. 
When three bands are involved, then the members from band A must marry people from band B. Band B members must marry persons from band C. And band C members marry persons from band A. These exogamous relationships are what occurs whenever young men and women live within a 10-day walk of each other. This means that gather-hunter groups marry their neighbors, not murder them as some of today's warring peoples might assume. In the previous chapter, we had a detailed look at the Canela Indians who live in the forests of Brazil. We saw that Canela chiefs are selected and that they can be unselected because of the personal character that they have demonstrated through the decades. They have earned respect through their maturity, conciliatory nature, and oratorical ability. The Canela village has one to three chiefs who each serve a different set of functions. They are always male and do not seek personal power. Essentially, they are peacemakers who settle disputes so that harmony is maintained in the village. The chief does not rule, command, punish, assert, invent new rules, exercise political control, wear a badge, receive extra food, or interfere in private affairs because the proper ways of life, tradition, culture, and ceremony dictate all activity and behavior. When a dispute between two individuals occurs and escalates, the extended families of both persons become involved. If their differences cannot be settled during an inter-family meeting, then a chief becomes involved. He will engage either a recognized mediator or a person with special ties to both families to find a solution that satisfies everyone lest the mutually beneficial village split. If the chief's decision is requested, then it is held binding because to do otherwise would bring the disapproval of everyone. Each morning, the council of elders, which consists of one or two dozen older men, meet with the chiefs to plan the events of the day. A Canela chief can do nothing without the approval of the council of elders. Together they might decide that today, two halves of an age group will go hunting in two separate areas or harvest rice on two separate family farms, or work on two separate sections of a road. They might decide that everyone should instead work with their families on their own farms, or in their own houses. Or they might decide that the entire village should go to work for a few days for nearby Brazilians, or prepare for a festival by disbanding and hunting for a couple weeks. The elder, leading members of Canela society meet each day to decide which village chores need to be done and what should be done to prepare for future events. Is this how you and 10 or 20 other families living together would cooperate? How does your society choose priorities and plan actions? Daily meetings begin with a discussion of such things as hunting, love affairs, a young man trying to leave his wife, cattle breaking into a farm, or a canela being harmed while traveling in a city. When facts are sought during a formal discussion, rumors are often found to be groundless. The leader of the meeting then summarizes the discussion and conclusions. To show agreement, everyone calls in unison in a voice that rises for four seconds and then falls sharply for two seconds. The town crier then sings out to the village the decisions that were made at the meeting. By 10,000 years ago, the planet was covered by hundreds of thousands of bands. As the bands of a region switch to full-time agriculture, their population greatly increases. In response, we have had to invent ways of organizing ourselves into structures larger than that of our innate band of a few persons glued together by family ties. A tribe is a collection of bands who know each other before joining together. These bands are not held together by family ties but by clanship or some other association. About 500 persons make a tribe. A tribe consists of persons who share language and culture to the extent that they have a feeling of unity. 
Tribes often formed to coordinate the agricultural surplus that occurs when full-time farming first begins to be practiced in an area. Tribal society largely emerged with the first farmers. Like bands, tribal peoples are egalitarian. It has a structure of government surmounted by a leader who embodies the people's will. No office with real power exists. The chief is chosen because of personal charisma and this leader can also be unchosen. Often the tribe varies in time, space, and season and is an unstable shifting alignment of clans. Every tribe has been different but they always form to manage a surplus or are an ad hoc response to an external pressure. Tribes sometimes form in response to invasion by a large imperial kingdom or state and then last only as long as that invasion lasts. The tribes of Europe often appeared 2,000 years ago in response to the invasions of Caesar and Rome. Some 1,500 years later, the tribes of North America often appeared in response to invading Europeans. The tribe does not have the means to conduct an all-out campaign. Instead, it ambushes with small hit-and-run raids. Their objectives are cattle, horses, to drive the enemy out of a favored zone or to prevent an enemy from expanding into their home area. Tribes appear today in response to outsiders forcing the bands of a region to form into a more formal government. A politician or leader doesn't bring the tribe together. Instead, an outside force brings it together. The tribe is more than a collection of bands, but it is a fragile structure. It can be a temporary pause between the lesser complex band and the more complex chiefdom or state. It has the potential to become a more complicated form of government. A chiefdom differs from a tribe in that it has a population of a few thousand persons and it has a city that serves as an economic, social, and religious center. Most every chiefdom formed as farming brought food surpluses that required organization and management. For the first time, food collection and redistribution became a part of society. The people of the chiefdom might live both in high and low elevations or in high and low rainfall regions so that a range in crops is available. Instead of people moving from area to area, those sedentary farmers now move their crops. They might also move wood, fish, game, nuts, and roots. A chieftain might develop to organize the existing trade between neighboring pastoral and farming groups. The accumulation, trade, and redistribution of payment requires organization, and organization implies leadership. An important leader such as an irrigation manager, might become the leader of an emerging chiefdom. The chief organizes labor into public works, such as the construction of irrigation works, the terracing of slopes, or the building of governmental palaces or religious temples. As tribes grow into chiefdoms, specialized occupations develop for the first time ever. The quality of work of a full-time craft specialist is greater than that of a jack-of-all-trades. When some members of society are able to spend their entire lifetimes producing a single item, they will then gain the expertise needed to create a higher caliber of finished work. The specialists are paid in food distributed by the chief. The chief's post might become hereditary, and soon after that, the chief's family and children and children's children form a nobility. Genealogical lists become longer and more important in inherited chiefdoms. This is done to help legitimize the position of the current chief. A band is egalitarian, chiefdoms are not. The office makes the chief who then makes the nobility that results in social stratification. After a few generations, the chief's position becomes sanctified by custom and mythology. Exogamy can be replaced with endogamy by social rank, 
where nobles marry other nobles from the same village. The religion of a chieftain begins with its shamanism and life cycle rituals and then adds ceremonies of a wider social purpose. Ancestor worship often increases. Some groups of people begin to consider their ancestors to be supernatural beings. A priesthood emerges as permanent professionals begin to officiate over ceremonies. Chiefs and priests often arise together and often both become inherited offices. Sometimes the same person holds both offices in a theocracy. The redistributional economy of a chiefdom has potential for expanding its population or its borders. Tribes and bands do not. When the chieftain brings together diverse regions, it can be beneficial to all of its members. States contain tens of thousands of persons. The public works of a chieftain are usually confined to one valley, but in the valleys of Mexico, Mesopotamia, and the Indus and Yellow Rivers, water control projects built canals connecting many valleys and led to the formation of state governments. States do not develop in regions where food is easily obtained, such as in the jungle, in Hawaii, parts of California, or the northwestern coast of the United States. The political organization of these regions never became more complex than that of a chiefdom. The pristine state develops with no knowledge of constitutions, legislators, bureaucracies, or armies, only lineage heads and temporary chiefs. Most emerging states were surrounded by and interacting with other emerging states. An irrigation system requires bureaucrats and administrators to direct the number of persons needed to build, clean, and repair the canals. Hierarchies of priest astronomers decide the proper day to plant, when to begin and stop watering, and when to harvest. They also oversee the construction of the large-scale temples that are used in worshiping the agricultural gods. With continued growth, managers of managers are needed. When there are about three hierarchical levels of managers, then that system might be seen to be complex enough to call it a state, and this hierarchy becomes a state. A single leader might occur at the top of the hierarchy, and this single leader might be elected or the position may become hereditary. This is an example of the integration origin of a state that develops to coordinate and regulate the different parts of a society that is becoming larger and more complex. Other political systems develop through what is termed the conflict origin of a state. Before this state forms, a wealthier class already exists. The haves may control the irrigation apparatus or the trade materials and its network and in turn might form a state government to legitimize and perpetuate their privileged position. State government is often begun by and is composed of those persons who control the assets and wealth of a group. In this case, the state is these persons of greater assets and wealth. That is, the owner and controller of the assets, the state leader, and the state government are all one and the same person or group. It is rarely the case that the state leader has no assets, but tells the asset holders what to do with their wealth. Sometimes this leader becomes a tyrant. A state and its unequal access cannot be held together by family and kinship ties alone. The ruler of a state maintains the people's consent and obedience by promoting an ideological basis of rule, such as a mandate from heaven, a state religion, or a belief that the leader has the status of a god or is a descendant from the god who founded the state. No state ever lacked an ideology that legitimized its power and sanctions its use of force and every state has had a physical apparatus for removing those who didn't cooperate. The chiefdom doesn't have the state's monopoly of force, and it does not have a police force with a license to kill.
States often conduct a census for taxation purposes and require that a tax be paid in materials or labor. This leads to problems of record keeping that are solved by the inventions of arithmetic and writing. Writing and arithmetic never occurred before states existed because a band of 50 persons would have little need for such records. Through time, we have had to invent ways of organizing ourselves into structures larger than that of our innate band of a few extended families. The size of our political structure grew from bands to tribes, to chiefdoms, and to states. A band consists of 20 to 200 or so persons glued together by family ties. The tribe is a collection of bands containing hundreds of persons tied together by clans that unite in response to something. A chiefdom has permanent leaders who collect and share goods and services from a central urban center comprised of thousands of persons. A state has tens of thousands of persons, and these members have unequal access to goods and tools. The state has permanent leaders and priests, and monumental architecture built by the public. 500 years ago, the planet was covered by thousands of kingdoms. There were no nations or nationalism. Most everyone considered themselves members of a kingdom, not a nation. The kingdoms merged into today's 200 nations. It is a safe bet that within a few decades, we will have some sort of global structure in which we will consider ourselves members of the global human effort. From the beginning, government has existed to coordinate our mutual efforts.